Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to this edition of Living the Little Way. Living the Little Way means that we do little things in our life every day to bring Jesus to other people, and sometimes that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, but we keep trying. We follow St. Teresa's example. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Heather Eicholtz, who is the one of the canon lawyers, the uh, uh, person that runs the tribunal office here in the diocese. And let me ask to, a question, Heather, to, to just kind of kick this off. What is a tribunal? The tribunal is the legal arm of the bishop. So the bishop has administrative authority, but he also has legal authority over his territory. And the tribunal helps him to administer all of his legal authority. So as a canon lawyer, you are akin in some ways to a civil lawyer who does that out in the business world perhaps, uh, but you help guide the process. One of the most important things that the tribunal does, of course, is to hear cases of uh, annulment. Yes. And also to make uh, rulings on when a marriage has lacked form, which we're going to talk about a little bit, um, and that a person then is eligible or able again to enter into, or, or for the first time enter into a sacramental marriage. Um, so tell me, what does it mean if somebody's married with lack of form? A lack <clears throat> of form means they married outside of the Catholic Church. They're a baptized Catholic. So what the church requires is all baptized Catholics marry in a church with the priest witnessing their consent and two witnesses. If for some reason they say marry in a park or a Methodist church, then they marry in lack of form. So that's a simple process that we help them through. So in other words, what happens is there's no sacramental marriage. Correct. Not even a valid marriage. Correct. So that's called a, there are circumstances, however, in which permission can be given for someone to be married in a Protestant church. Yes. Um, and then that is a sacramental marriage. Yes. Uh, permission for mixed marriage. And they would just go to their priest. He would fill out a form. He would send it to the tribunal. We would sign it, grant the permissions, and then we recognize that marriage. But if that's not present, then you have uh, a nullity yes. there. There's another kind of process that happens when somebody enters into a valid sacramental marriage, uh, but for some reason a divorce occurs, uh, and they come to the tribunal and they, in essence, say, we don't think our marriage was valid from the start. Can you explain a little bit about what annulment means? When you marry in the Catholic Church, we recognize it as a sacrament. So there's a special kind of grace in a sacramental union. And what an annulment does is it takes a look at the marriage to see if the sacramental grace is there. Marriage is always good and natural, the type of uh, marriage that Mary and Joseph had. Good and natural marriage is God intended and initially created because Christ elevated marriage and gave it a special grace. We say that it's a sacrament and that's the grace, the grace that Christ infused marriage with. I'm looking to see if it was present or not. There are certain circumstances that the church acknowledges can block that grace from flowing through the union and making it a sacrament. Um, if somebody suffers from schizophrenia, um, that can be a problem in a marriage if it's not under control. Um, if <clears throat> there's any type of abuse that shows lack of respect and dignity for the other person, um, if you marry out of fear, or you marry because somebody forced you, say, a literal shotgun wedding, 
if you marry under the influence of something. These are all things that hinder the free will that God gave us. And so those are circumstances the tribunal looks for to see if the marriage is sacramental or not. And if we find that there are these circumstances that exist, we can declare the marriage to be non-sacramental and allow the person to receive their sacrament of marriage again. Because they've never been married to yes. begin with. Um, there's a certain kind of uh, thing that, you know, that where sometimes people promise to do something. For example, uh, the three questions that you ask, will you uh, be faithful? Will you stay together for life? Uh, will you accept children lovingly from God? And let's say someone uh, said, yes, I'll accept children. But really in their heart, they said, I really don't like kids at all. I have no intention of ever having children. There's a breaking of the word there. There's no promise being made. You're saying one thing with your mouth and another thing with your heart. Yeah. Is that a ground for annulment? Yes. Actually, that's called an exclusion. Um, when you marry in the Catholic Church, like you said, you make promises. And those promises form a covenant, just like the covenant God has throughout the Bible with his people. And so when you look at this covenant relationship, what you say has to match what you do. If it doesn't match, then we can declare the marriage invalid and tell the person they can have their sacrament of marriage again. Um, so it's not just the Catholic form of divorce. No, as a matter of fact, this is not a divorce. A divorce would mean there actually was something and now we're splitting it apart. What this process is saying is there was never that grace, so there was never that sacrament. So we are declaring something that should already be known. And in reality, the church doesn't recognize the civil process of divorce, which is a civil reality. What we are concerned with is the sacramental reality. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I often hear, Heather, when I talk with people that are contemplating a, uh, an annulment, is a real fear. Um, I don't know whether I can go through this. I don't know whether I can admit these things that happened. Um, it's a long process. It's going to it's going to cost me thousands of dollars to do this, um, all of which are, you know, uh, not true. That it's, uh, yes, it's going to be difficult maybe, but we're there to help you with it. Can you just go through the process of what you would do if you want to go to the tribunal and say, hey, look, I think that I, my marriage is invalid? Sure. Um, first, if you contact me, I always send them back to their pastor. Um, the pastor is the most important part of the process because the pastor is looking out for them spiritually, which is what's going to keep them in the process. Um, so I send them to their pastor and I tell them, just approach, say you'd like a petition for an annulment, sit down with your pastor, have a conversation. Um, once they collect the documentation and fill out the petition. Which is, what, what are the documents? The documents that I need are the judgment and decree of divorce from the civil court. I don't need anything else, just that one or two page, because all I have to do is see that the judge signed it and the clerk of court filed it, because it proves there's no chance of reconciliation for the couple. That's all it's used for. Um, and then usually the marriage certificate, the marriage license, um, the certificate from the church if they have it, anything that proves the date they got married. And then if you're Catholic, I need your baptismal certificate with your notations. The reason I need that is for the notations. When I look at the notations, I want to verify that maybe your spouse didn't already start this process. Uh, because we don't want two processes going on at the same time for the same marriage. And then I verify the baptismal date. Um, the petition is a little more involved because they have to write a uh, personal history. Um, and normally if they call and they're having problems with the personal history because the questions feel invasive, 
I ask them to just answer what they're comfortable with because later on in the process we have an interview. And if there's anything missing, I can ask them personally then. So you ask them to prepare a history uh, of their interaction, meeting with, leading to marriage with this person. <clears throat> uh, and of course, an annulment is, is based on the idea that something was lacking before the marriage was even entered into. Yes. It's not like, you know, I can, I, everything was going great up until the 15th year and then I became abusive. Right. That's not a ground for annulment. Right. Um, so it has to be. A, yeah, there has to be circumstances present um, while you're dating. And normally because we're human beings, there are, we may not see them, but that's where the tribunal comes in. Because as a neutral party looking at your history, I might be able to see something that you didn't. An example might be something like this, that let's say someone uh, came to the tribunal and said, my spouse has been uh, unfaithful to me. Um, and it started after we were married 10 years. Sometimes you can go back in the history and say, well, look, he had a or she had a history of being unfaithful, even in dating relationships that was part of their personality way back then. Yes, a lot of people, um, they get very upset when they hear infidelity doesn't invalidate marriage, but that's just if all of a sudden it's a one-time thing 20 years in. Most of the time when somebody comes to the There's tribunal, I, yeah, when I go backwards in that timeline, I can see where, well, he called you and told you this, or she said this, or they did this. And th these things connect up to show me that there was infidelity back when you were dating them, when you were engaged to them, when you were planning the wedding. So they may have promised fidelity, but for whatever reason, they just they couldn't do it. do it. Sometimes the, another question that people often ask is, or a statement perhaps is a better way to say this, if you got enough money, you'll get an annulment. Uh, there's that old idea that it's, it is going to cost you much money, and the more money you have, the more likely the annulment. Is that true? No. Um, to be honest with you, most of the people who come to my office are just like me, middle-class Americans, um, living paycheck to paycheck on a budget, feeding kids and a family. Um, money has nothing to do with the process. Uh, as a matter of fact, we ask for filing fees, which are usually $50 for the formal process, but most of the time I tell people, if you can't pay it, don't worry, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. We still process your case. So that, that notion of only the wealthy can get an annulment is, is completely false. The other thing that people sometimes wonder about is why does it take so long? It takes a long time because the Vatican has a very specific process set up with steps because they want to make absolutely sure they never harm anybody in this process that what we do is the best possible thing to do for that person's soul and salvation. So what the Vatican did was they said, you can have up to one year to take care of a case. So everything has to be done within that year's time frame. Now, I can move a case faster if I see that circumstances are there, but I can never move a case faster than six months. So within six months to a year, I always tell people, you will have a decision. And they can call me at any time for updates or to ask questions. Do you use um, any testimony from experts? Yes. As a matter of fact, expert testimony is required in certain circumstances. If we join something on a ground called lack of discretionary judgment, Usually that means that there are some behaviors that are going on where I need a psychological expert to weigh in because I'm not a psychological expert. And so I need for that psychological expert to read through the testimony and tell me th certain things 
that will point in directions of behaviors and why the behaviors are taking place so that I have a better understanding of the couple and what they dealt with in their marriage. And so I serve in a, a consulting capacity for mm -hmm. the tribunal in that particular area. Do you ever use other kinds of experts? Um, yes, I do use Sister Mary Carol Curran um, from time to time. Um, usually what happens is most marriages are declared invalid on lack of discretionary judgment because as human beings, there's a lot of things that we can do or choices we can make that affect our behaviors. And so I usually will have the judicial vicar, Father Shockert, weigh in um, because he's been doing this so much longer than I have. And he'll say, well, Father Odell is the expert for this or why don't you send this one to Mary Carol Curran? Um, he just, he tries to take a look at what each person's area Maybe. of expertise is in. Yeah. So when you, um, invariably there's going to be a time that an annulment is denied. Um, and how do you deal with that? That's very hard. <laughs> it's, um, it's not pleasant to have to tell somebody that their marriage is valid. Um, so what I like to do is I like to call their pastor and I like to have a conversation with the pastor about why the marriage is valid, um, what led the tribunal to that decision, just to forewarn them that the person may come to his office looking for guidance. Um, or just plain upset. Yes, but I also tell the pastor that the validity of the marriage was found on this particular ground, but I have other grounds that I can look at. And if I see a different ground that I think we might be able to move forward on, I'll also tell the pastor, I'm going to tell the person that I'd like to do their case again on this different ground and see where we come out. But I always have to have the person's permission to do the case to do again. That. Are the things that happen in the tribunal, the information that's shared, is that confidential? Oh yeah. Many people don't realize, but we actually have a law that says a person has a right to their reputation and nobody has a right to soil that reputation. So I always go through the confidentiality with the people that come to my office and I make sure that they know exactly who's gonna see the file and what they're going to see in the file. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always assure them that at the end of the process, we seal the file and put it in an archive. And then after 10 years, we are supposed to destroy everything except for the sentence. One of the things that I've come to appreciate uh, about our tribunal is it moves quickly and it moves with charity. The other thing that I realize is people will come to me and they are upset, um, perhaps they uh, have entered into another union after their divorce and they didn't have an annulment. And they'll say to me, well, we just never went through the div uh, annulment process because we knew there was no hope. And so then I start asking questions. Um, and lo and behold, something might come out like my first husband was was, uh, you know, not married validly in the, ch in the church, didn't have permission. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that invalidates the marriage. They were completely unaware that that even had happened. So they married him and all of a sudden the problem becomes something you can deal with quite easily. Easily and quickly with a few documents. So you got to go to the, to the horse's mouth, so to speak, to say yes. <laughs> We, we can do this. Yes. Um, most people who I talk to that think there was no hope, that's not the case at all. There's always hope um, because where would the mercy and the love of Christ be in the process if we told people, oh, well, you're stuck in the situation mm -hmm. you're stuck in? That, that doesn't bode with Christ's message. We're there to make people's lives better, not yeah. worse. So... If there's one thing that you could share with people about the process or about the office, 
what would it be? That I am exactly like them. Don't be afraid. Please come to the office. If you need this process, just start the process. There's no judgment in the office. Judgment is not what we do. We render a judgment, but we don't judge people. Uh, I'm not capable of judging people because I've probably made the same mistakes and I see myself in almost every single case I read. You know, we're human, so there's only so many things that we can do and we all do them in one way or another. Circumstances just might be different. So don't be afraid. One other question that I want to just throw out there because I think it's happened to all of us that have been working with the tribunal at all, there's, a, there's an affirmative decision that's rendered on the part of the uh, tribunal here. In the old days, that used to have to go to another diocese for affirmation. Now that's not the case. But even though you render an affirmative judgment, the other party could contest that and request that it be sent either to the archdiocese or to Rome, mm -hmm. which, of course, can become quite a lengthy process. Unfortunately, yes, um, especially with COVID having happened. What people don't think about the, the other party is that the Vatican gets cases from the entire world. So they have to take them as they come and as a set of three judges is available. And that can take two years, five years, 10 years. I try to work with as many respondents as I can to make sure that they're comfortable with the process, comfortable with the decision, um, so that we can avoid those pitfalls in the process for people. And an embitterment that sometimes comes. Yeah. So I always tell the petitioner, please have the respondent call me, have them ask me any questions they want. I will be open with them. Um, I even, if the respondent is of a different religion, I even say to them, you can bring your pastor with you. Uh, sometimes they feel more comfortable with that. And I'll talk to both people in my office. I try to do whatever that person needs me to do in order to make them comfortable and understand what's going on. So it's important that people reach out and get the facts and find out. Very well, I thank you so much, Heather, for being here today. I think it's important that our people understand the process and understand the reality of what annulment means and what is the difference between uh, an annulment and a declaration of nullity and those various other things yeah. that we do. Thank you again. Thank you. Alrighty, so Father, I noticed that our Bibles in the Catholic Church have 73 books, but the Protestant Bibles have 66. Why is that? The canon of Scripture contained uh, 73 books as approved by the Fathers of the Church. Uh, the Protestant Reformation occurred, and certain of those books that we have in our canon were removed by the Reformers because they, first of all, could not trace them back to the Septuagint Greek translation and because they disagreed with some of the, the, the theology that was contained in those books. So they were simply removed. And let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Until next week, have a good and blessed time with God. <laughs>